Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker and I'm here with Jeffrey Poole and Joe Lalo. And we have a science fiction writing guest for you guys this week, Terry Mixon. I'll read his intro and uh, then we'll let him talk. <laughs> uh, Terry is the author of the Empire of Bones Saga and the Humanity Unlimited Saga. He's served as an NCO in the United States Army 101st Airborne Div Division. Ah, pronunciation so hard. He also worked aside, alongside the flight controllers in the Mission Control Center at NASA Johnson Space Center for almost two decades, supporting the Space Shuttle Program, the International Space Station, and other human space flight projects during his tenure there. He lives in Texas with his lovely wife and a pounce of cats. Um, Terry, is a pounce of cats actually a thing? Uh, it's the word that we use for it, and we certainly have um, more than our fair share of cats that we've rescued over the years. In fact, they keep jumping up here, so if you see cats come running by, well, <laughs> that's just the way it works. We'll get more likes on YouTube if you show off your cats, so <laughs> that's great. Okay, I've heard of a clouder of cats, so I, I thought that might actually be a thing, so I wasn't sure. We like the word pounce better because it seems to be more descriptive. All right. Well, if you get pounced or tackled in the middle of the show, uh, we'll just keep going the best we can. <laughs> Um, why don't you start out telling yourself, uh, telling yourself, telling us a little about yourself and how you got started writing? Well, you've read my background, so I've I've done a lot of things over the years, serving in the military, working as a computer specialist, uh, as a contractor for NASA. I've done all kinds of things, drove a cab, done any number of different things, and I've been a voracious reader since I was very young, but I never actually started writing until about ten years ago when a friend of mine sent me a draft of his novel and I said, you know, I've got to get off my, off my butt and start writing. If, if I ever want to do it, if my friends can do it, I can do it. And that's pretty much how I got here. Stumbled my way through. I think that uh, explains a lot of our careers. <laughs> uh, so what drew you to doing space opera? I mean, I guess I can guess from your background, but uh, was that just the, the first thing that you, or the thing you always wanted to do, or have you tried other genres? Um, I've, I've written erotica, and I did very well at that um, for a, a couple of years, and I decided that it's not something that I really wanted to do long term. I, it's okay for writing it, but I enjoy writing what I read. I read science fiction. I like space opera. I always have. I like mysteries and, and that sort, too, so I may write mysteries in the future as well. There's no telling what's going to come out next. <laughs> All right, so you paid off the house with the erotica, and then you decided to switch to your true passion? Gosh, if only I had paid off the house. <laughs> at, least, at least it helped pay off the bills for the first couple of years. Um, I got laid off from uh, NASA in April of last year, and um, that money in the bank came in helpful, and the money from the, the sales of the science fiction is, is proving helpful in making the transition to full-time writing. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank um, you. Did you decide to self-publish? Like, what made you decide to go that route instead of looking for an agent or thinking about traditional publishing? Seeing how some people were doing and having successes with their self-publishing convinced me to give it a try, and the try was successful enough to where I said that, that I can retain complete control over what I'm doing, and I'd rather go that route. I'd rather not be beholden to somebody that I have no idea what they're going to do and give them rights that last long after my death to, to my work. All right, we all understand that here. <laughs> so I'm going to hand you off to the guys to ask some more questions and then later on we'll get into the marketing side of things because uh, our guests might want to know you've been doing pretty well lately so we've got to pump you for information on that. Surprisingly well, it shocked me anyway. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, as your intro suggests, you were associated. You were actually associated with NASA for years. Uh, how much do you think that influenced your writing? Um, I think it influenced my writing a, a fair chunk. Um, it certainly gives one a different perspective when you work in the same building as the flight controllers, and you see professionals like that going about their their work daily, and you feel like you're part of something to do with space. It's it, it's an amazing feeling, and it, it definitely gives you lots of little bitty kernels of, of information that you can tuck away in your subconscious for using in stories later. 
Yeah, I can imagine. Also, I guess it would sort of... Uh, I haven't read your stuff, unfortunately, but I, I would assume that having uh, dealt with the actual space industry, you might uh, get a little bit of a harder aspect to your sci-fi, like more uh, uh, grounded in reality, or at least in physics. You sure can tell it from the what I write. I write space opera, so hard science is not necessarily what I'm doing. There's lots of hand wavium going on. As there should be. That's why it's fiction. Uh, yeah. Oh, do you think that, uh, again, having been associated with actual space agency, do you think that uh, uh, some of your readers who know that might have expected you to, to stick to a higher standard or might have held you to a higher standard? Uh, I don't know what they expected. Um, they haven't bothered to tell me if, if that's what they expected, and I don't know if I've satisfied them or not. Well, uh, in my experience, when fans are not satisfied, they let you know. And also, they stop being fans. <laughs> Uh, all right, so space opera. Uh, one, I guess I want to say is, what do you think makes for a good space opera? What, what sort of defines a space opera? It, for me, it starts with the characters. It's got to be some people that are interesting, that get into trouble, that you want to see them actually get out of their trouble. And the space opera portion of that is the canvas on the story, on which the story is, is drawn. And uh, so when you can combine a grand story with characters that, that are doing things that are interesting, that uh, are continuing a struggle that, that the readers find interesting, I think that all combines together in what I define space opera. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, it's funny. We, uh, I've compared space opera as being like the, the uh, counterpart, the science fiction counterpart of, uh, of, of epic fantasy, where, uh, uh, you know, it's about a journey to some, to, to some extent, even if it's perhaps not going from place to place, but from... Uh, you know, perhaps politically from point A to point B. But it's got a big scope, and it's got a big backdrop, but mostly it's about following people. Mm -hmm. And I so, think there's a strong dash of adventure in that absolutely. that also goes along with the epic fantasy. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's it's like... I have I've had people ask me what space opera is, and I had to try to explain to them in the terms of Star Trek versus Star Wars. I was like, well, Star Wars is, is more space opera than Star Trek is, okay? That, that, that'll get you somewhat closer. Um, well, you, again, speaking of story, then, uh, when you plot out your stories, do you, do you plot out a vast, sprawling plot and, and arc, or do you try to focus on reasonably standalone stories and really focus on character and let the larger plot sort of reveal itself on the fly? I have to focus on the character because I'm a pantser. When I start writing a novel, I have virtually no idea of where it's going to end up. I may have um, a climactic scene in mind, but more often than not, it doesn't go there. It gets halfway there and then makes some left-hand turn and goes somewhere else because I've, I've had a thought and went, ooh, that's such a better idea. It's, it's like watching um, a movie in your head and, and directing it on the fly. So that's, that's pretty much how I, how I write a novel, I'm afraid. We have that in common. It's amazing how often your characters can wander off in the wrong direction. You're like, well, let's just see where they're going. Mm -hmm. They usually know what they're doing. Well, then you, you just have to say, how can I make this worse? What can I do here that would be exciting to watch that probably my characters won't enjoy that much? Yeah, yeah, because, you know, drama is the essence, oh, you know, conflict is the essence of drama, so, well, things are going a little too well for them at this point, it's a monkey wrench in the works. Exactly. Uh, having let the, 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 the series and the stories develop from the seat of your pants and moving forward, have you sort of developed a, a larger arc that goes from story to story, or do they, again, do they sort of stay within the same book? No, there's, there's an overarching story that's going along behind the scenes. The, I think of them... As, as arcs in the story. The novel might have a small arc or even small sub-arcs inside the story, but there's an overarching theme that may take several books to resolve. And um, some that have been going for four books that are still not resolved. So it's, it's just a matter of, of how long it's going to take those different themes to resolve themselves. I try to have as many that seem to be useful and even the ones that I don't use that much, because I'm a pantser, I put them in the book anyway, they're hooks to come back to later if I decide to, to use those for something further along the line. So that proves useful as well. Yeah, I, I, the hooks for later are great, and, and occasionally, occasionally you can explain away a plot hole like that. Like, no, 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 that wasn't a plot hole. We'll find out more about that later. Uh, 
well, I guess I want to say too is then, so as the story develops, and you say sometimes you have a climactic scene in mind which may or may not occur, do you sort of have an end point for the series, or is it just going to continue onward until the characters hit their, their uh, eventual end? Until the story feels like it's wrapped itself up, but it's such a large scale story set on, on such a huge story backdrop that it's, it feels like David Weber's universe. It's never mm -hmm. going to end. It's just going to keep going for a long time, maybe longer than I do. Let's hope oh. I don't pull a Robert Jordan. Let's hope. Uh, yeah, okay, well, that, that sort of concludes my questions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand you off to Jeff now. Alrighty. When it comes to your, your writing of the space opera, do you find any parts of it tedious or difficult? I mean, is there any advice you can offer any of our listeners that happens to be thinking about starting up a book in space opera? Well, I do find some things uh, tedious, and usually if I'm, I'm finding myself bored with a part of the story, I stop and I back up a little bit because I figure I've took a wrong turn somewhere. And uh, I figure if I'm bored, the reader's going to be bored, so I need to, to make sure that I stay interested so that the reader will. I have no idea if that's true, but that's what I'm going to run with. <laughs> no, I think that's a totally good I, no, good answer there. Because if, if I'm riding along and all of a sudden I hit a spot like, uh, I don't really like where this is going, then yeah, I'll do the same thing. I'll back up a page or two and say, okay, well, all right, instead of turning left, let's turn right. There's more bad guys this way. Let's just see what happens that way it's, instead of a, you know, a free reign there. But okay, yeah, I do that. Um, as as uh, Joe was mentioning earlier, many people immediately think of Star Wars when they hear the word space opera. How do you typically present your books when it comes to wooing a new reader who might not know, let's say, you, you write books? I just phrase it as, think of it as an adventure, but set in a futuristic world. Uh, I find that those those basic terms are something that, that anybody can grasp, even if they don't know what space opera is. Space opera doesn't mean that much to a lot of people. They, they won't recognize the term, but they understand what adventure stories are, and they understand what, what science fiction is. If I combine those two terms in some way, they'll figure it out. Have you ever made any comparisons with existing stories? Like, for example, if you like this, then you'll definitely like you know my stuff here. I have not. Good for you. All right. When it comes to the actual writing process, do you give yourself daily word count goals, or do you just sit down, start writing, and see how long you feel like writing? I've tried to give myself daily word count goals, and it always seems to intimidate me. Even when I set the count low and, and try to do it, then I feel guilty when I miss it. So what I've turned to instead is trying to get a certain amount of hours in the chair. So for whatever reason, the time spent doesn't intimidate me the way the word count does. And I don't always make the, word, the, the, the um, hourly goals that I want in a day, but every day is a new goal. If I miss a day, there's always tomorrow, and I try again fresh. I don't try to keep a monthly goal or a weekly goal. It's every day, one day, always the present. And good for you. Yeah, we actually have. I'm, I have a feeling I know the answer to this, but several of our several of our guests have informed us that they aren't necessarily concerned with what is written, provided they write something, thereby suggesting the quality of work that might not be the greatest. Would you agree with that particular method, or would you say, oh, if you're not comfortable writing it, you know, don't write, and then like come back to it later? I think I would disagree with that simply because I've had days where I didn't really feel like writing, and I've had days where the words just couldn't come out of me fast enough. And when I come back and I look at the story later, I can't tell those days apart. I can't tell which part was written when. So that tells me that how I feel really isn't affecting the story. Not not so much that I would notice. Yeah, good for you. Because I, I am, unfortunately, if I'm in a bad mood, wow, does it come through in the writing. Because my wife, you know, who likes to, you know, like, proofread after me, is like, okay, did, you, did someone piss you off? I mean, why, are you in a bad mood here? I'm like... I I was earlier. She's like, well, dude, you need to rewrite this because it's just coming through loud and clear that you were mad. I'm like, fine, I'll go ahead and rewrite the thing there. So, yeah, I, I, I've got to make sure I'm in a happy-go-lucky mood or else yeah, it translates right into the what I'm writing. It seems like when I'm writing, it, the characters take up residence in my head, and the feelings that I'm having at the time, if I'm annoyed at something, it won't take long before I forget about that because I get buried in the story that I'm telling myself. It's In a way, it's a very much so like reading. You can lose yourself in the story, and as I'm, I equate reading and writing the same in my head, and it, it seems to work out that way for me. Once I start writing and I get into the story and the characters, then the outside world vanishes. 
Yeah, I do the same thing where you know, once I'm in that zone, I'm riding along there, I lose huge chunks of time. <laughs> and you only have to be late picking up your wife a few times and you start setting backup alarms just in case. So got to be careful with that. But All right, uh, that's it for my question. She's got some marketing information or questions she wants to ask you. Sure. That's right. I have all the information. I'm just going to tell everybody what they should do. <laughs> all right. Um, so we've had a couple of guests on who were doing well with Space Opera. Could you tell us kind of what are your thoughts right now as we're uh, January 2016, kind of the state of the genre? What's your experience? My personal experience is that every book that I come out with does better than the last one. And I, I, I think the genre is on the rise. I think that, that more people are finding it, although I have no actual evidence to back that up. It seems like more people are finding me anyway. Yeah, I'd like to cruise around the top 100 lists on Amazon for the genres that I enjoy reading. And it just seems like a lot of the space opera that's in like the top 20 or 40 is also really high in the overall Amazon store. So naturally, I want to write a space opera series sometime. <laughs> I'm just lucky that the what I like writing is actually doing so well. It, it could have turned out it could have turned out that I, I like writing historical romance westerns and there I'd be stuck. God only knows where. I don't know. I think those uh, <laughs> western historical romances might out outsell epic fantasy. I'd, I'd have to go look. But um, no, could you tell us kind of like how did, how the launch of your first book went? Did it did you start with a bang or it kind of sounds like it might be kind of gradually progressively getting better? The first book started with, um, it did much better than I expected it would. I, I tried to go into it with, with very low expectations. And um, it, I think that if, if I remember right, it debuted somewhere in the 20 or 30 thousands. And over the course of two weeks, it actually got up into four or 5,000. And I was thrilled with that because I, I had no, no idea how well it was going to do. I had no mailing list to um, prompt readers to, to go find me. I did have um, the podcast to, to let some folks know about it, but who knows how that's actually going to work out the first time you try it. Um, I put a, a link to a brand new mailing list that I created the day before the release and sent it out with uh, that in the front matter to the book. And it seems like every single release after that, the uh, numbers on the mailing list shoot up and the number of people that buy the next book goes up and each one is done better than the last one. Yeah, that's awesome. Did you try like 99 cents or anything like that? Or did you have a, big, a strategy that you were <laughs> following for that first release? No, I, I put it out for $4.99 and, and kept it there. The okay. only time I've had a sale was during the, this, la this latest release. I put the, the first three books on in the series on sale for 99 cents for three and a half days and 2.99 for the other three and a half days on a countdown deal to see how that worked out. Hmm. And did you when did you launch the first book? You just did the fourth one that came out, right? I just did the fourth one in the series. The first one was I want to say July of 2014. Okay, and have you kind of been pretty regular in your releases every six months or five months or so? Oh, no, it's, it's been <laughs> scattered all over. I had, by the time I released the first book, I had the second book mostly written, and so it came out three months later. And then there was a gap of six months before book three came out, and then there was another gap when I brought out the first book in the Humanity Unlimited saga, and then this latest one here. Now that I have more time devoted to writing, hopefully those gaps will shrink because I've seen how badly the gaps cause the sales to fall off. Yeah, we've definitely had people talk about, you know, kind of that 90-day cliff or 30-day cliff where it seems like it, when you do do the new release, if it, you know, it can start selling well on its own sometimes, but then maybe you get that 30-day mark and the easy sales can just kind of drop off. It peaks up about the first two weeks and then it starts trailing off and by the time you hit 90 days, it's down near zero. Right. And uh, I think Joe's got some questions about KU later, so I don't want to take his stuff too much. But I was just curious if you were always in KDP Select or if you started out trying to go wide. I started out in KDP Select to give it a try to see how, how that worked out for me with the expectation that if it didn't work out, I could go ahead and leave inside of 90 days and the experiment would prove a success or prove a failure. And it was 
so much so successful that I haven't looked back. I've just stayed inside of it. Okay, and was uh, KU, had that started up yet? When you, It sounds like you were kind of right at the beginning of that when you launched your first book. It was. It had, it had just started up. I think it had been out, I want to say, a month or two, long enough for me to look at it and say, hmm, maybe. And uh, everything that I'm doing in publishing, I'm reporting the results through the, the Dead Robot Society podcast and on Facebook because it's so hard to find actual results of people trying things and seeing what actually happens to them. So I, I've I put it all out there in the open and I report what my sales are, I report what my earnings are and let people see. I, my initial thing was see how see what mistakes I've made and, and how they might learn from me. And it, instead it seems that they've I've, they get some hope from from my success that maybe they'll they'll have some too. Yeah, do you get any backlash or anything from uh, people? Like, I always feel, I started out doing the same thing. I was very open with my numbers, and, uh, like, when I tried advertising or something, I was like, I sold this many, and, you know, and I think that was fun when I was making, like, a few hundred dollars a month, but I guess as the income grew, I worried that people would resent that or that readers would be like, oh, why don't, let's go pirate these books. She's making good money. We don't need to pay for that. <laughs> or, I don't know, you know, you wonder if other authors would be resentful or anything like that. If they have been, I haven't heard about it. I've, I've heard nothing but, but positive so far coming back on that. People saying that they're grateful to see what's happened so far, see what, what results that I've had. Nobody has come to me and said that, that they thought I was trying to brag or, or do other things that made them feel bad. So I'm thinking that it's, that it's worked out well. Uh, there was a second part to what you said. I've forgotten what it was. It'll come back to me. It probably wasn't important. <laughs> no, it's just uh, I, I do know there is a guy that does uh, the Smart Passive Income blog, Pat Flynn. You know, he do, like, talks about internet marketing, and he shares all those numbers, and he makes, oh, I don't know, like six figures a month or something crazy like that. So it seems to have worked for him, but uh, I guess I'm always a little wary of putting it out there because I know a lot of readers read my blog too, and I don't know how they would feel. <laughs> but, well, so far, it hasn't hurt. Um... And the, I just released the the inform. I haven't told them how much I made in the first 30 days of Ghosts, so I haven't seen any results from that. But they they heard what I did in December, and I didn't get any negatives from that. Okay, and you said this was the first time you tried the countdown deals and the drops to 99 cents. Do you think you'll do that again? That seemed like a did it kind of get a lot more people into the series as you were launching that fourth book? I'm not sure that it got a lot of people into the series, but it got a lot of people reading it. It was Kindle Unlimited. That's what the other comment was. Um, it's It seems oddly enough like I've got two separate audiences inside of Amazon. I've got the people that are interested in buying the books and the people that um, solely read on the Unlimited program. And oddly enough, I make more money from the Unlimited program than I do from sales. I, I have no idea if anybody else has that particular set of happenings. Uh, piracy, that's what we talked about, piracy. I'm not worried about piracy. If somebody doesn't want to buy my book, they're not going to pay for it anyway. It doesn't bother me. They're, go out there and knock yourselves out. If you want to spend them as much time buying, uh, searching out my books on a pirate site, then knock yourselves out. It's not going to kill me. All right, good, uh, good attitude not to worry too much about that stuff. It's not like you, we can control it anyway. So I'm kind of curious, is it just since the Kindle Unlimited became uh, the page reads, getting paid by the page reads, is that when you saw the uh, big, incre a big increase in earnings? Or were you doing well under the old program too? I was doing well under the old program. It was about 70% sales, 30% Kindle Unlimited income at that point. And it seems to have switched around now to where it's 40-60. 40% sales and 60% Kindle Unlimited earnings. All right. Yeah, I, I actually had the same experience with my pen name. I think that my pen name makes more in borrows than uh, sales since I switched into the KDP program. So if you've got the longer books, it really seems to help right now. Mm -hmm. And it seems like uh, with the page reads, it takes people longer to read through those, and it seems like that keeps the books at a higher ranking longer than just the sales did before. Yeah, I've, I'm not sure actually how they're doing it right now. I've kind of heard that it's whenever the borrow is, is when it counts. 
but it, it's kind of hard to tell that because we don't know. We no longer see like when the borrow. We just see the page read. So they could have borrowed it three months ago and just reading it now. But yeah, I'm not sure how it hits the ranking. It's 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 hard to know with Amazon. All right, one more question for me. I was just curious. You have one book in a new series that it looks like you launched in August or so. Mm -hmm. Was that just to give you a break from the other one, or was there any marketing strategy going on to <laughs> try something to new? Me, it was to give me a break from the other one, and um, I'm almost done writing book two in that series. I'm over 85,000 words. I figure I'll wrap it up in the next week and start editing it, and then I'll go back to the, the previous series. I'm, I'm thinking that I'll have the two series that I'm writing now and possibly a third one that I'll add at some point in the future. That way I don't get dead tired of writing in the same universe going forward. And right. I've noticed that oddly enough that when I have a release in one book series, it only marginally affects the other series. So having multiple different series to release books in may mean a greater income over the long term as, as the books spike up and then drift slowly back down again in each series. Yeah, I've definitely noticed that if you have one series that does really well on the heels of a promotion or something, that at least some of the readers will go on and check out your other series and so it can kind of keep the income steady from month to month. Mm -hmm. I noticed that talking about the countdown deals, the um, it picked up the books, the previous books in the series, and it brought them back up to uh, rankings in the three, two and three thousands again. So new release type numbers again. So the the countdown deal was a very successful for me. I was very pleased with it. Yeah, it definitely seems like a, a good reason for especially newer authors to consider going exclusive with Amazon when they're starting starting out, or even you know if you're still doing well, staying in there for a while. The um, Ghosts has actually been out for 30 days now. This today is actually the 30th day, so I was I was looking back to see what it had done, and um, it's earned me more money than any single release thus far. It it actually made me nine thousand dollars this this 30 day period. With the other books, it's almost nineteen thousand dollars for those 30 days. That's going to pay the bills while I write a few more books. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Is that uh, better than the erotica did? It is. It is better than the erotica did. <laughs> All right. It's, it's nice to know. I think everybody has this kind of assumption that if you really want to make good money in self-publishing, you have to write erotica. And that's not true. There's a lot of science fiction and fantasy authors out there doing really well. No, I think they are. I, I, having, I, I was successful at writing erotica, and I'm more successful at doing this, so there's absolutely nothing to, to say that one is better than the other. Write what, you, write what your passion is. That's what you should do. All right, good advice. I'm going to go ahead and pass you to Joe and uh, let the guys ask some questions now. Yeah, uh, uh, as was mentioned uh, a bit already, uh, you are one of the hosts of a podcast, The Dead Robot Society. Guilty as charged. <laughs> uh, what sort of stuff do you discuss on that podcast? It runs the gamut on there. We, we talk about anything that we think sounds interesting that has some bearing on writing. We've, uh, we'll talk about different aspects of how to write science fiction, our personal opinions on what they are, how to write horror, um, how to do characterization, the, the technical aspects of it, to reading uh, an assigned book. One of, the t one of the hosts will assign a book and we'll read it and we'll see what we can learn from it as far as writers, what we liked, what we didn't like. So we're all over the map with that podcast. I think that's sort of the sign of a good podcast. Uh, it's at least ones ones I listen to. Uh, do you think it's helped your your writing uh, in general? I hope so. I've certainly learned a lot doing it. And uh, obviously, anybody who listens would also be learning a bit as well. That's what the readers tell us. So we haven't we haven't fallen down to where we we've ran out of things to say. We're an opinionated bunch. <laughs> that certainly helps. Uh, and like uh, you mentioned a bit that, that uh, uh, you were able to uh, get some new readers through it. You think that, that continues to happen? Is it? You think this is one of the one of the more useful uh, vectors for new readers to to discover you? I think that it might be somewhat helpful, but the biggest boost that I've gotten by far is by having a uh, mailing list, a Mailchimp mailing list, that I send out only new release information and sales. 
so people know that they're not going to get any spam from me. I, I don't put out a monthly newsletter. I just put out a notice whenever there's a new book. And it started out with the first book having zero people signed up for it, and it's got almost 800 now. And it's been by far the biggest impact in, in my improving sales because it seems like those first couple of days of people buying and starting to read the book in Kindle Unlimited have a big effect on where it debuts. Yeah, we've definitely told, uh, we've discovered time and time again that, that the, the number one thing to, to sort of do, if you, especially if you're a new author and hopefully any author, is to maintain a, 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 and actively grow a, a, a mailing list. So yeah, it, I can definitely see how uh, it can have a huge impact. Um, okay, so looking at the lineup in your book catalog, uh, I gotta say you sort of nailed the classic space opera cover, uh, in my opinion. Thank you. Particularly Empire of Bones Saga. Like it looks, I have books on my shelf that look like that, and I have seen books on bookshelves that look like that. Um, how much thought did you put into the cover design? My wife actually does the covers, and so we collaborated pretty pretty heavily on it. I picked the initial image that I liked uh, from uh, deposit photos, and she went ahead and, and started playing with making it look professional. She's much better at that than I am. <laughs> it's, it's, it's handy to have someone like that around. Uh, to give you an idea of how professional they looked when I was reading up on you and, and making my questions and I saw the lineup of, of, uh, of covers, I went to see if you had, like, is this guy published? This, this looks like uh, the traditional stuff. So, you know, thumbs up on that. Thank you. I went to, um, um, I've been to a couple of Dean Wesley Smith's uh, workshops on the Oregon coast and part of that was cover design. It was incredibly helpful to know how, what the elements were of professional covers to try to mimic the uh, commercially produced stuff, and and that was actually the goal. I'm glad to hear that it's working. Absolutely. Um, all right. So Kindle Unlimited, spoken of a little bit already. I, I just it's clearly a source of great success for you. Um, have you in, had any instances where you would have wanted to do something, but your exclusivity prevented it? No. I have not. I've I've heard a bunch of other people talk about how they would they they would like to do other things. I'm, I'm perfectly happy in the, in the sandbox that I'm in. I've sold my erotica going wide and I've seen how much earnings are percentage wise and I won't make up the money that I'm making on Amazon by going wide. So I'm, I'm not missing it. And I've only had in the two years doing this, two people complain that they couldn't find the book on anything but Amazon. So I don't think that it's having a big effect on me. Certainly, you certainly seem to be, like, as again, very successful with it. Uh, I, like, I feel as though, and like, I have, because of a recent book that I released, uh, uh, a translation that was released in Kindle Unlimited, it's my first book I've ever had in Kindle Unlimited. And I'm seeing that it's had a huge impact on the earnings of that book. And it's one of those situations where I started wide. In fact, I started before I really had an option. And I have lots of fans that discovered me through other means and I have relationships with other, with other uh, uh, distributors. So I sort of wonder if things had gone differently and I had started in KU, if I would feel the same way I do about wide distribution because uh, what I want to say is uh, you say you haven't had any promotional things you want to do, your sandbox is big enough and there's absolutely plenty that can be done on Amazon exclusively because they are by far the largest distribution. But uh, I guess almost because I have to, I have to keep numbers up elsewhere. I am always finding new promotions that require me to be wide. I, I wonder how much of it is necessity versus uh, versus uh, uh, availability. I have no idea. The only, yeah. the only other promotion that I've tried to do is I tried to get a, a bookbub promotion and they turned me down. Say la vie, such is life. Yeah, such is life. Uh, your bookbub does that. <laughs> That's what uh, it happens to everybody. Yep. It's sort of interesting how uh, the different the different point of views, like the different point of views that can be developed depending on how you enter the business. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that uh, I'd say that concludes my list of questions. So we're going to hand you back off to Jeff for just a few more. <clears throat> All righty. Um, so I meant to ask you, what degree of social media do you use? Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, if any. 
I, I am active on Facebook, but I wouldn't say that I'm the universe's most active person on Facebook. I tried Twitter, but I'm afraid that, that that's just not my cup of tea. Maybe I'm too old for Twitter. No, if you are, then so am I. I just I, I, I couldn't really get into it there. Um, but I was going to ask you, do you feel it's important for authors to, to stay in contact with their fans through some type of social media? I think it's important for authors to stay available to their fans through some type of social media. I don't think that you have to, if, if you are already somebody that's on Facebook and or on Twitter or on some other social media platform and you're active there for reasons that are valid for you right then, certainly add in being available there for your, your readers as well. But if you're not already somebody on social media, when you try to do it just for the marketing standpoint, I think it comes across as odd. I think it comes across as a little, a little forced. Yeah, a little, pre you little presumptuous. Be, yeah, if you if you're if you like an author and you start following one up, all of a sudden the only thing they really post is, "Hey, I've got this new book out. Come take a look at it." And tell, I mean, they say that, but pretty much the same thing over and over and over. Instead of just saying, "Hey, how's it going? Anyone see the new Star Wars movie yet? It was great." But you know, there's stuff like that. But okay. Um, when it comes, to, I, you've mentioned you touched on this a little bit with regards to your mailing list. How you say you've got you know up to like 800 people now. There is that pretty much. You said you, that's what you use your mailing list for is one, just just solely to announce like a new release coming out. Yeah, I, I I put in the book that it's only for new releases and for if I run a sale because I thought that I might do that at some point and I did. And um, I have it in the front matter of the book. And when the story ends, I, I put the front, I put the listing of stories and the link at the end of the, the story as well. Give them two opportunities to, to click and go join up. Yeah, fantastic. I, I do something similar where, again, I'm, I'm, one, I'm one of the group that I wish I would have started with a mailing list like right when I first started all this, but I didn't get into that particular game until, I, not, not too late, but you know, I'm, I'm still slowly building up my actual people or subscriber list on there. What are some of the most effective ways that, uh, do you feel that some our listeners might be able to build their, their mailing list? I mean, do you offer incentives? I mean, obviously, you just mentioned you provide more. Well, I imagine you provide links in the back matter of your books, that sort of thing. I have not provided incentives as of yet. So the people signing up just want to make sure that they get notified when the next book comes out. Um, I've seen other people that have provided um, incentives of a book, and I thought about doing it, but I've just never gotten around to having an extra book that I could do that with. Since I'm solely on Amazon, I get a little leery of, of making a book available somewhere else because who knows what Amazon will do. <laughs> yeah, they'll wave their magic wand and say, you will be struck down. God darn you. You just released something somewhere else. And Yeah, I've had them. I, I've actually had them gripe to me about it. I'm like, I'm not signed up for KU. I was like, oh, yeah, sorry. I was like, man, you guys are scary. <laughs> But uh, all right, um, I, I think that's it for the marketing questions that I have. Let me pass you back over to Lindsay, and so we can actually a little bit early, but we can try and wrap this up. All right, I might have to throw out a few questions. Can't let you go too early. Come on, you know. come on. Bring we, we paid for the whole hour, so we want that's your fine. time here. <laughs> I, I will say that uh, I've never done an incentive either on the mailing list. I've just had. You know, like, here's the link, sign up. And I still think an incentive is a good idea, but I always wonder if uh, you get as many buyers in the mix when you're giving away free stuff as you do when, uh, you know, they genuinely want to, like, be informed of when they can buy the next book. That's true. I'm, I could at least be sure that, that everybody that signed up had, at least at the time they clicked the link, a desire to, to hear about that next release. Yeah, it's a little difficult for me since I also blog about self-publishing, so I get people just signing up to like see what my newsletter looks like, I think. But uh, the pen name, pen name one is a little more authentic, and it has a really high click-through rate, so I figured that's good. Um, I was looking at your books and noticed you've got quite a few reviews. Have you done anything to uh, try to do like a review team, or you just do you ask for reviews at all, or nothing? <laughs> the first couple of weeks that the book is out, I will make a couple of, of posts on Facebook saying that, that uh, if you've read it and you liked it, please go leave a couple of words to that effect. And if somebody actually emails me and say that they liked the book, then I'll thank them and, and ask them to, to leave those words on Amazon. But I don't really go out prompting for reviews. I figure that people will leave them if they, they feel the movement to, to go ahead and do so. And uh, pestering them for it probably isn't that effective. 
Right. I think when people are struggling to get reviews and you see somebody that has a lot of them, part of it is just realizing that it's a byproduct of having sold a lot of books. So, I've heard it said elsewhere that the, the best thing you can do to market your book is to write another one. And I think that's true for, for bringing in reviews as well. Getting people involved in the series will get people hooked on it and get them to, to leaving reviews and, and to turning other people on to reading your books too. Definitely. Uh, I was curious if you've played with pre-orders at all or if you're just releasing them and sticking them out there. I saw them, but I'm a little, little nervous about trying something like that because I have a good idea of what the books that I release now, what their trajectory is going to be. Although I'm secretly terrified every time I release a new one that it's going to be when somebody now figures out what a fraud I am. And that's going to be it. That's the end right now. But uh, I'm afraid of pre-orders because I don't know how that's going to affect the ranking. Yeah, I've definitely, they seem to be good on the other sites. On Amazon, I've done them with the last three of my Dragon Blood books because I didn't really care that uh, I figured nobody was going to see book seven and, and just randomly grab it because it was at the top of the list. And it's, it's, it's a throw-up, you know. It's like it's nice to get all those sales at once and to get the big chunk. But at the same time, you know, I, I do think they drop off a little more in the rankings more quickly when you've diluted it that way. That's, that's actually what I was afraid of. I like that slow coast down. All right. Unless you're Jim Butcher, and then you can do a pre-order for nine months and, and still have a <laughs> New York Times bestseller. We haven't had him on the show yet. I'm sure he listens, though. Well, of course he does. <laughs> All right. Uh, kind of the last big question. Do you, what are your plans for the releases of your future books that you have coming out? Are you just going to stick with the same program, or do you have any new things that you want to try? I'm going to stick with the same program. It's working. It's, it's simple. It's straightforward, and it's not a lot of, of brain power. And if it's not broke, I'm not going to fix it. <laughs> All right. Have you combined any advertisements with, uh, like with your countdown deals when you did the yeah. 99 cents? I've, I've never tried any advertisements, so I, I have no idea. I've seen other forums where people are talking about the advertisements, and it certainly seems like they have a fair chunk of negative things to say about them, like Facebook ads. They ran about Facebook ads and, and how not very effective that they are. I have no idea if that's true or not, but it's enough to make me say, hmm, yeah, I'm not worried about it. Yeah, we've had Mark Dawson on some pe and some people on that have done well with Facebook ads, but you really do have to sit there and spend a lot of time tailoring them and watching your ROI and making sure you're not just spending a lot of money for no reason. So <laughs> can be tough. All right, I guess we should wrap it up here. Do you have any advice that you'd like to share with other authors, uh, especially people who are just getting started now? We're our own worst critics as authors. Don't feel like what you've written isn't going to be successful. Keep writing, keep publishing, produce the next book. You'll continue to get better. Every book you put out will be a better one than the last one. And don't worry about whether you succeed or you fail to begin with. A career is a much longer thing than the success of one book or not. Hey, great advice. And I think that people can really learn from your example of just kind of keeping their keeping the series going and continuing to build more readers and more fans with each new release. I think as a series, if, if that's what you choose to write as a series, I think that those are excellent vehicles for building a career off of because the longer the series, the more sustained income you can get off of that series and the better you'll do with more books in that series. At least that's been what I've seen. All right, cool. Well, we hope that things continue to co continue to go well for you. And uh, why don't you tell us where people can find you online and uh, what's the name of your first book so they can check it out. You can find me online on Facebook, um, Terry Mixon. And you can find me on Amazon. I'm the only Terry Mixon there. Easy to find. <laughs> but on Barnes & Noble, there's just like three or four other ones. <laughs> I haven't gone looking. There's no time. Right. <laughs> Just making sure. I do have a website, terrymixon.com. It, it's a very bare bones sort of affair, but you can go there and sign up for my mailing list to find out when the next book's coming out. Um, I urge you to go try a sample and see if, if my brand of space opera is to your taste. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us, and I hope the listeners enjoyed the show. Thank you for having me on. Thanks for all the info, Terry. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Bye-bye, right, everyone. Bye-bye.